This is the J. Scott Outdoors podcast on Western big game hunting and fishing brought to you by GoHunt.com Insider. Research faster, hunt more. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider and join today. I'm your host, J. Scott, and I live and breathe hunting and fishing, spending half the year in the field experiencing God's creation. I hope you'll enjoy hearing about our adventures. Guys, this is going to be a great episode with the Outdoorsman's Western Hunter, Elk Hunter Magazine, Wilderness Athlete owner Floyd Green. And as a part of this episode, we're running a special promotion with the Outdoorsman's, and that's 10% off of any Outdoorsman's products. So you guys need to give them a call at 1-800-291-8065 and use the J. Scott promo code and get 10% off on all Outdoorsman's products. I want to thank GoHunt.com for their sponsorship of this podcast being the title sponsor. And you can sign up for Insider by going to GoHunt.com Insider, excuse me, forward slash Insider. Click on the blue Join Now button. When you click on the blue Join Now button, if you use the J. Scott promo code, you will receive a $50 Kuyu gift card. They will send you an electronic gift card. I also want to thank DeadeyeOutfitters.com. Deadeye Outfitters makes quality t-shirts and hats. These guys are hunters, and they make this uh, stuff uh, with hunters in mind. So you get a 10% discount of all purchases on Dead, at DeadeyeOutfitters.com by using the J. Scott promo code. So I want to encourage you guys to go over there and check it out. Guys, uh, this is going to be a great episode with Floyd Green. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of subjects here, but the, the main subject is lion hunting. And uh, Floyd has been uh, dry ground uh, lion hunting for many, many years. And uh, I know you guys are going to get as much out of this as I did. Uh, so I want to thank you guys, my listeners, for all your support. Uh, you can send me comments and questions at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. You can follow along the elk hunting adventures for the 2015 season on my Instagram account, at jscottoutdoors. Of course, the blog and the YouTube channel and the Facebook page uh, will be updated when I get back from elk hunting. Uh, but uh, guys, uh, it's uh, going to be a great season. I've already been getting pictures of antelope and, and coos deer bucks and mule deer bucks and uh Elk season is uh, right here in front of us. Uh, give it 110% and let's go get them. Uh, let's uh, take each hunt session and, and, and give it all we've got. So, um, guys, thanks for your support of the podcast. Let's get right to the episode. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have a good friend of mine, Floyd Green. And I've admired Floyd for many years. Uh, one, as a businessman, two, as a person, and three, as a hunter. And uh, we've shared shared some good experiences together in a lot of those different um, uh, aspects. And um, I'm happy to have him on the show today. Floyd, how you doing? I'm good, Jay. How are you? Oh, doing just fine. Uh, for the listeners out there that don't know Floyd, uh, Floyd is the owner of the Outdoorsman's in Phoenix. And uh, we've had uh, Floyd's partner, Cody, on several times in this podcast, and uh, they sell a lot of great hunting gear and, and are the uh, greatest optics dealer in, in the country here and um, do a lot of volume of business. And uh, I always say their customer service is number one. Um, several other businesses that Floyd owns is uh, the Western Hunter Magazine, Elk Hunter Magazine, and Wilderness Athlete. And Floyd is involved in real estate and a lot of other endeavors and uh Floyd, I've always looked up to your business prowess. Um, can you give me a little bit of background on kind of how you started and, you know, what you cut your teeth on business-wise um, and, and how you've had the ability to branch out in a bunch of these different businesses? Well, I got, you know, everything started with the outdoorsmen's back in the early 80s, uh, 81 or 82, and it uh, it was a very small business that did just whatever it could do to survive for for several years, and then it took on more of a uh, a hunting oriented presence. And over time, we you know we picked up the Zeiss company and we're 
very big selling their products in the 80s and then Swarovski came on the scene as a brand new company uh, I think Jim Mori and George Cornell uh, when they came to the outdoorsman's it was one of the first 10 or 20 stores that they'd even put Swarovski in in the country at that time uh, and then over time we began to develop some of the products that that helped facilitate the optics in the field with the tripods and tripod adapters, binocular adapters, and things of that nature. The uh, the Western Hunter magazine, really, it uh, it was originated through Lisa and Rusty Hall came down to Phoenix and helped me put together kind of a catalog more than a magazine. And it stayed that way for a long time until my partner, Chris Denham, took it over and took it to a whole other level, and it is what it is today. And the Wilderness Athlete? Wilderness Athlete was a uh, kind of a an interesting deal. Cody's brother, Wade, called one day and asked me if I was interested in buying that company. And at the time, I was uh, really trying to get out of businesses. And so I was very shy about it, but, but eventually ended up purchasing. And as you know, you were right around us in the midst of all that when it was going on. I had a very limited knowledge about nutritionals at that point, which has changed dramatically. That was six years ago, and that company and my partners in it are just out of the park, whether it's Mark Paulson or Chris again or Chris's daughter, Courtney. I mean, those people have really taken that company to a level that is that seems like the sky is the limit for it. Floyd, in business, um, a lot of times uh, I hear it over and over about surrounding yourself with with people that are as good as you, as intense as you, and ha have the passion that you have. Uh, tell me from a business perspective, um, you know, mainly giving me some advice and listeners some advice, how important is it to, to surround yourself with good partners uh, in whatever bi business venture you might uh, undertake? Well, it's, it, to me, it's, it's really all about the people. It doesn't doesn't seem to matter if you have a great group of people that have a high level of integrity in both work and in their personal lives, and they're intelligent and they understand how to, to operate in business. You can take them anywhere and do anything with them. So you have to seek those people out constantly. You have to learn to manage your own ego, which in my case, you know, in my younger years was a tremendous issue for me. And you know, and allow those people to do what they do best and, and be a good partner. Just treat people like you'd like to be treated uh, and, and constantly be looking for those individuals that can help propel the company and you can help propel them in their own lives. And that that really is kind of what we are doing now and I like to think we're doing in all of those companies and it just seems to be working really really well and it's in i couldn't be happier with the whole group of people we have now they're super super solid super smart you know one thing i might add to that is um you know not only western hunter and and wilderness athlete and the outdoorsman but also elk hunter magazine also western hunter tv show um in the the whole conglomerate of all the companies that you have have just done extremely well and I know the popularity of uh, the Western Hunter TV show has just really taken off, and uh, I, I follow you guys on uh, social media, and and uh, you know you get lots of great reviews, and you have a lot of fans, and I think that's a true testament testimony to um, you know the hard work that you've put in, but also the partners you've chosen. So, you know, I give you kudos for uh, picking good people to work with. Um, one of the main reasons why I wanted to have you on today on the podcast is, uh, is as much as you are a businessman, you are a, a hunter at heart. Uh, I, I know you, I've been around you enough to know that, you know, you're constantly thinking about hunting and specifically your favorite hunting is, is lion hunting. And I wanted to talk to you today in this podcast about lion hunting because it is something that that uh, sometimes is misunderstood and, and it's something that I don't know a lot about. I know I see quite a bit of lion through my, through my optics, but as far as hunting them, um, I'm really looking forward to picking your brain about lion hunting. My first question would be, Floyd, when did you start lion hunting? You know, I, I got my first hounds when I was 19 or 20 and, and have, you know, done it continuously since then. So 34 years or so, uh, of it 
but really when you begin lion hunting and when you, it's such a, a metamorphosis from knowing, from wanting to hunt lions to actually being capable of, of catching lions or really hunting them well. I, I don't know when I became a lion hunter, but it was somewhere in that process. But I started when I was in my late teens. And what was it, Floyd, uh, when you started? What was it that drew you to uh, wanting to become a lion hunter? Well, it's a combination of things. Uh, I was fascinated with lions. That was the first time I ever came up and saw one in a tree. Just a you know tr- truly magnificent animal, and and it's uh, it's just you're fortunate to be in the presence, and, and very exciting. So you know that that was always you know one of the foremost things. But secondly, is the challenge. I really, into still to this day, don't think that there's many things that are harder than to go consistently catch bare ground lions free casting your hounds. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've said this comment many times, but it literally, it, you know, it took 30 days to learn to fly a helicopter. And it's, you know, I feel like it's taken 30 years and I'm still working on trying to figure out how to catch lions. And, you know, I'm a student of the game and pretty much everything that I do. And it's one of those things when I get into something, I, I want to be, good at it and I, I want to become efficient at it, uh, you know, don't necessarily have to be the best in the world, but certainly want to be uh, good at what I do. Um, what are some things that, you know, maybe held you back um, from being what what some would say is a great lion hunter? Because I've heard a lot of people call you a great lion hunter. W- what are some of the things that maybe um, – at first held you back from from being as good as maybe you are now? You know, probably one of the things that's held me back on a lot of things in life, quite simply thinking I knew more than I did. Um, You know, it was, it's amazing today. I probably know a thousandfold what I did when I started, yet the smallest nuances of of the sport, you know, still constantly my mind changes and and my attitudes change towards it, and I'm always trying to learn. I think that if I had to pick one thing that slowed me down the most, it would, I would say that it was my uh, lack of ability to learn and to to realize how little I knew, I guess. So when you were younger, you just thought you knew basically everything and, and you, you were unteachable, but you would say maybe the older you've gotten, the more you realize how much you, you try and learn everything there is to know about your sport. Absolutely. That's, you know, and you can learn the smallest little bit of knowledge from even a person with that you wouldn't normally expect to learn anything from. And that, you know, in lion hunting, typically, you know, it's just hours in the field and, and many, many days of following following your, your dogs around on horseback. And, and the, the hounds really teach you more than anything, probably, or any person. But I can remember Roger Scott and Tom Boggess both were guys early on that helped me get started. And I'm sure those guys probably thought about just shooting me a couple times, you know, just because I'm <laughs> so annoying. And, you know, in retrospect, I wish they, you know, I could have really sped things up by paying more attention. When you started out and got your first string of dogs, um, how would you say your dogs then compare to the dogs that you have now? Um, very similar or very much different? And, you know, they're really, some of the characteristics in the breeding is actually still there from 30 years. But for the most part, they are a much different type of hound in the sense that they they move a track much quicker. They're much more aggressive. And that's a lot of that has to do with lions have changed a lot over the last 30 years. It used to be that if we trailed a lion up and jumped it, nine out of 10 of them would either come to bay in a pile of rocks or up in some sort of a tree and, in today's world, at least half of them, when they hear the hounds coming, they start moving. And it takes a different kind of dog, a different, a much faster dog to overtake those animals. And many times you don't overtake them. Julie and I had a, a case this year in New Mexico where we turned out what started off on a horseback deal at 8 o'clock in the morning in a track that had crossed the road. Uh, it ended at 5 o'clock that night with me calling from help from the local rancher eight air miles away across Arizona into New Mexico. We saw the lion twice, filmed it once, and never did catch it. They're just, they've changed quite a bit over the last 30 years, so the hounds have had to change too. 
Absolutely. Floyd, I, I want you to talk to me about lion sign. And, you know, I, I recognize scratches, but I probably walk by way more lion sign and I recognize tracks. Um, but it, to me, it's still a lot of mystery. Um, can you walk through and, and tell my listeners about lion sign and what to look for and, and maybe just kind of talk about tracks and talk about scratches and talk about, you know, all of that. Well, I think that, you know, one of the simplest things for, for guys that are out hunting, whether it's elk or deer or whatever, is, you know, is to be aware of your surroundings and, and it's always good to know. I mean, many times you'll be in a, in, in a deer oriented situation and you'll wonder what happened to these deer that you had patterned and you, you felt like you knew so well and you can have a lion come in there and set up camp for day or two and completely disrupt any kind of pattern that a prey animal normally has one of the things that that you know for hunters i think you know keeping your eyes on the trails when you're on the trails that they're dusty you'll you know lion tracks they step straight up and straight down so they leave a very distinct footprint and it's uh it, you know, that's one of the places that most guys will see tracks. And, and if you, most people don't really know what a lion track looks like. Savvy outdoor guys do. But typically, I'd say get on Google Images and spend, you know, just type in mountain lion track. And you'll see the lobes on the heel pad and some very distinct features about them. But they really just look like your house cat, too. If you just roll your house cat over and take a look at its foot, you'll see those three lobes on the heel pad, which is the most distinctive item. Then after the tracks, the you know really gets kind of tough, Jay. I, you know, I know you see scratches and scrapes were here and there, and, and there again you can get on Google Images and pull those up, and you'll see it just kind of looks like a little mound. And uh, typically the lion makes that mound, you know, kind of to where the piled up debris is at the back side of the mound is where he came from. He's headed the other way. So that's how you know you'll find lion hunters are always looking for that when they're trailing or in pursuit of a lion just as one more indication of which way it's going. The other the other thing a lot of times you guys find that uh, out hunting a lot are, are kills. And uh, if you see a lion's, you know, most of the time, if you see a lion's tracks going in two or three different, you know, multiple uh, directions on the same trail, probably has a kill somewhere in that general area. Those, those are kind of the biggest things. I know you've glassed a bunch of them up over the years, uh, that's, uh, you know, certainly a, a fun way to, to harvest a lion is to glass one up, but not many people actually do a whole bunch of that. Yeah. You know, um, Floyd, I wanted to bounce back to something you just said. So when you see an actual scrape and, it, and to me, what it looks like is where even if a human were to take their hands and kind of paw backwards and make a pile, what you're saying is if the pile is in the back and you can see where they've been scraping towards their body, that's the direction they're heading. Did, did I hear you correctly? That's right. And it's, it's amazing how accurate that is. Uh, I, I just, I mean, I don't know anybody that hunts lions that wouldn't immediately go that direction. And, and many times you get, you can get fooled by that just because you found a lion scratch doesn't mean that's where the lion was that you're trailing at the moment. But, uh, you know, Typically, that's one more indication that you'll use their, their traveling in that direction. And when you find those um, scratches and scrapes, Floyd, um, how do you tell freshness from that? And um, do other lions come and check those? Do they have like a, a, a scent line, like a, a, a coos deer buck or something that they'll, they'll make scratches along that ridge and then other lions will come and check that? For sure, they, they, it's exactly what they are. They're, they're a combination of a territorial marker to let other males, typically males make those scratches, although females from time to time will make a, a scrape of what looks a little different to the trained eye, but, and they're very rare in comparison. But typically it's the males, much like a male dog lifting his leg on a fire hydrant. And that's one of, they do that for, from a territorial standpoint. They also do it to help the female lions find them in the woods, it always amazes me how lions can regroup and find each other because they seem so secretive and so quiet and, and elusive. But by the same token, they have quite a, a series of communications they use. That's one in the scenting of it. 
And then they also rub, if you ever watch a cat, it'll rub along the edge of the couch or it may rub here and there. Those lions have a sense of, a sense of smell that is fairly close to that of a canine, I believe. And so they're constantly utilizing that to determine if it's, I, I believe that they can determine different lions in that, just like we can tell different people's voices. But then the, you know, and then the last thing that they've used probably the most is they are very vocal. They use a, a vocalization much like a whistle or it sounds more like a chirp, like a, a whistle chirp combination to a person. To, but that, that is one of the ways they communicate. It's definitely by that, those scrapes and scratches. And the freshness um, aspect of it, um, how, how can you tell if it's uh, fresh or old? Or I'm sure that comes with time and and uh, seeing lots of them and being on the trail a lot. But what's a general rule of thumb on either A, the tracks, or B, you know, the scrapes and rubs and stuff? Well, it's it's uh, normally what houndsmen do or, or the guys I run around with are doing is, you know, we'll look closely at the track, and if the hounds are there, you just get the hounds out. If the hounds can move the track, then you've got to figure it's in the last 24 hours, and if they move it quickly, it's probably in the last six or eight hours. So that'd be the first determination for a houndsman. And if you're not a houndsman, it, you know, like if I'm just out and, and I'm going to call on the radio to have somebody bring me the hounds and I'm looking at tracks, what you look for are the finer points uh, between the toes, if that dust that's there is is rolled over, if you can see little what look like they're pebbles or little rocks in the track, typically that means that the the wind has blown the finer dust away from it. And all in all, I, I you know it's really kind of a gut feeling because in so many places the conditions are different. Uh, and I'm speaking right now about looking at a track on a road for the most part or on a trail. Uh, you know, and, and like you and I have hunted together enough, you know, I rarely go anywhere without two or three good hounds. So, you know, we've always got them at our disposal. They're going to pretty quickly let you know if they can do anything with it. Would it be safe to say on most, you know, say Arizona dirt roads, um, you know, pretty dusty type roads, um, not talking about muddy conditions, but if you see a, a dusty track, it's probably a day or two old. Uh, most of the time, it's going to get blown out if it if it's older than that. Is that a pretty safe assumption? Uh, you know, it'll be blown out in the sense that it'll look older. Um, you know, when you see them on a dusty road in Arizona, if we've had any wind blowing, and they've got those, you know, they look crisp. And you know, I mentioned earlier that a lion steps straight up and straight down. If it looks, they'll actually look kind of shiny because they've compressed the the granules of the sand or the dirt down. And if they look, if the track looks shiny where the heel pad is and where the toes landed, and and you've got those finer edges of the sand still standing, then you're probably within a few hours of that line. Floyd, what is the difference between a male lion and a female lion other than size? Is there anything really that differentiates the two? Well, their 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 heads are probably the most distinctive thing to the to the trained eye. Uh, the males have a blocky, square-looking head, and the females have a very round, pretty uh, head about them. And it doesn't really seem to matter how big or small they get. You can go up in the Kaibab and find female lions that are far larger than the male lions that you may find in central Arizona. But their heads, their skulls give them away almost in an instant look after you've looked at a few of them and become pretty well trained to them. New Mexico actually has a great hunter education course for cougars. And uh, anybody that would like to learn a little bit about it, it's kind of fun to take it. It's um, an online and, deal. That's interesting. Uh, and then <laughs> it always seems like when I glass them up, they always look so big, you know, and you, everybody says, oh, he was a giant, he was big. And the more I see, the more I am able to kind of objectively look at it and say, oh, it's a, you know, younger, younger cat. But, you know, a lot of times when it's a big tom, I feel like I can distinguish between a big tom and, and a female. Um, but it, it always amazes me when I see them, how, you know, just slinky their tail and it just kind of is always moving back and forth. And, 
and they seem to move with such ease um, and do everything so easily. It just uh, they're a, definitely an amazing animal. As far as their track, Floyd, um, uh, is 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 a male and a female track exactly the same, other than size. The female obviously is probably going to be overall smaller. They're identical, and okay. you know, in in many big female lions, there's there's when there's like that. When, they, when the female lions reach that 80 to 90 pound class and the males are that 100 to 110 pound class, it had take a lot sharper lion hunter than I am to tell which one's which at that point. Gotcha. Okay. So when you're when you're coming across a track, most of the time when it's a mature uh, track, you have no idea until you actually see the lion or or get it treed or bayed. You you don't know if it's a male or female. Are, are there um, and I'll let you answer that question. And then I would ask, are there certain things when you're tracking a male or a female that you'd say, I think this is a male because of, or I think this is a female because of, of, well, the of answer, what they're doing? In, you know what I mean? What they're doing in the chase? It really is. The, uh, but to answer your first question, normally I make an instant assumption. I don't know why, but I typically always think I know whether I'm trailing a male or female after say a mile or a half mile of tracking but it and if i see the track i almost immediately make a distinction and most of the female lions are probably between 70 and 85 pounds so their their tracks just have a little smaller footprint to them and when a male lion his foot is going to it will look quite a bit bigger typically even when they get to be that two-year range they're, they're they're larger i mean so i i answered the first part of your question probably somewhat misleading, but, you know, I normally have a gut feeling about which one it is. And, and every year we get fooled by that, though, uh, I guess is what I was trying to say. And and uh, you'll put one up a tree and it's actually a male and you kind of thought it was a big female type thing. But the second part of the question you asked there about whether you know which one you're following, I always, it's, uh, I always like to tell the story like this. When a, when a guy goes into a, a department store he kind of knows he needs a set of tennis shoes. If he's going to walk into the department where they sell tennis shoes and he's going to buy one. He's going to or pick one out and he's going to go back to the counter, buy it, get back in his pickup truck, go look for his buddy's booger and beer. Well, when a girl goes in to get a set of tennis shoes, <laughs> she makes about nine trips to 14 departments wandering around that store. And female lions are no different. They don't go as far as males most of the time. And they... You know, they check every rock and, you know, they just wander around more. And it's and really after about a mile, almost always, I feel like I have a gut feeling for what we're trailing, whether I've seen a track or not. That's very interesting to me. Um, so on the when you're tracking them and, and you're actually hot on their trail, it, I from what I hear you saying is the, the, the tom, the male lion, is actually uh, going to go further uh, whereas the female doesn't have, won't stretch out and reach out as far as, as the male. Is that a general rule of thumb? Yes, that's correct. And they have a smaller region that they, they you know, like to call home. Not that they might not leave that for any number of reasons, but, you know, they're, I don't think lions ever set up uh, a habitual home per se. They they kind of, kind of go wherever they want, particularly the big males. But when you're trailing a lion, it's always easier to trail the big males because where they they travel much more consistently and they 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 leave off more scent. So you know that's another sign that the dogs are struggling with it and and always seem to be having trouble moving it. Uh, it's you know that's a good sign that it's a female or you're way behind a male. And with the female lions, you know I these trail cameras have really educated me on a lot of situations of where I thought we were trailing 24 hour old tracks. And I've really come to the conclusion that if we're much more than four to six hours behind a female lion, she's probably pretty safe. And we many times will trail up to, a, well, both males and females, but particularly the females and be within 50 yards of them and think that they're nowhere to be found. And the dogs, you know, eventually bump into them and push them on out. Wow. 
Um, Floyd, let's take a break here um, and hear from our sponsors, and we'll get right back into the questioning. Uh, um, this is a fascinating subject for me. Guys, as you know, GoHunt.com Insider is the title sponsor of this podcast, and I wanted to remind you that the September Insider Giveaway is 15 Sunto watches. Last month, the month of August, they gave away 10 Kuyu sleeping bags. The month of July, they gave away four big game hunts. The month of June, uh, they gave away a Nahani Butte Outfitters doll sheep hunt. And uh, all you have to do is be an insider. To be an insider member, all you have to do is go to gohunt.com forward slash insider. Click on the blue join now button and use the J. Scott promo code and you will receive a $50 Kuyu gift certificate just for signing up and being an insider member. I want to thank GoHunt.com forward slash insider for being a title sponsor of this podcast. Floyd, have you seen um, cases where ex extensive lion hunting has helped uh, deer, elk, and sheep uh, and really seen them flourish and, and the contrary to that, have you seen the lack of lion hunting in areas where the lions have just taken over and, you know, just eaten everything out of house and home? You know, the it's always hard to know when they ate everything out of house and home because it happens over a, a long period of time. But uh, I've been around some places where the lion population had actually, the lions had moved on because there was almost no prey left in, in certain areas. And it's uh that one's a little tougher for me to answer but the first question about whether i've you know i've been involved in a, several different types of lion removal where we were working whether it was for livestock or for wildlife and you definitely can have an you know an effect there very quickly by removing the female lions typically uh and getting them off of the fawns or the uh the lambs and and you know, allowing the prey species to reproduce. I know um, back, I think it was the uh, late 90s, uh, you drew a sheep tag in Aravipa and harvested a tremendous ram. But I remember distinctly um, uh, listening to you in the interview talk about how you had felt that lions had really taken a toll on that um, herd in Aravipa. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and, and maybe what you've seen as of late and if there's been some recovery there, which I believe there has. Well, the, the you know, we ought to talk after that about the 22 work that uh, the Sheep Society and Steve Smith did. But in that particular region with uh, Aravipa, there was a what I would call a, a decline to the point of possibly losing the, the sheep herd occurring and you know a lot of people had seen that that uh, dramatic drop and and a lot of people were getting a lot of lion uh sign on uh, both in trail cameras and and uh hunters finding kills and, and things of that nature so the chief society engaged scott derringer who's a great young lion hunter out of the safford area and and he went in there and removed i, I don't know what the, the number is now but the first year i know he removed I believe twelve. And was it Scott or was it Sam? Was it Scott or was it Sam Floyd? It was Scott. It was Sam's son, and I'm sure Sam okay. was there helping him and, and being there when he needed him. And and I imagine Scott Senior was there and helped out too. That's that's a formidable family of lion hunters right there. <laughs> the, uh, so they they went in there and 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 were able to capture quite a few lions. Uh, how long ago was that roughly? You know, I believe they started it four years ago. It might have, I believe it was four years ago. And uh, the third, the second year they did, they took quite a few out. And the third year, the lion population was down to where, you know, they were struggling to get very many removed out of there. Um, and, 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 and hopefully that that will continue. I mean, they, they now have that lion population down in, in where it should, uh, it should allow those sheep to come back. The problem with that area is much like 22 and many of our other great sheep hunting areas, it's a natural influx for lions. Not only is it a major tributary or drainage that runs through the area, the San Carlos Indian Reservation, which you know is a tremendous wildlife sanctuary on the on the north side, and the Galero Mountains, which are uh, a lion reproducing factory, 
on the, you know, or the, well, or life is on the north end of the Doleros. And, you know, that's just a, a daunting place for a sheep to, to grow old because the, um, my whole life that I've hunted lions, we've always been able to go to the Galeros and find lions. They, there's, there's always been a lot of them there. I think that right now is that that sheep herd is poised to recover and should do well. And it looks to me from what I've seen of their, their surveys and what people are talking about that the, the lamb survival is up, you know, quite a bit. And Floyd, also you talk about 22 and and uh, Steve Smith's work up there and and uh, helping that sheep population. Um, what do you know about that? And and were there a bunch of lions taken out? And do you feel like that that herd is is also um, doing very well? Well, the you know that's kind of a bittersweet study or or whole that whole historical chain of events. Back 20 years ago, when that was initiated, uh, our game and fish department pretty much tried to tell everybody that all of our sheep issues were related to drought and disease. And there was, you know, there was a group of people that just knew that wasn't correct. And long story short, the people at the department also knew that. And the study was initiated. The Sheep Society funded it and drove it, got it done. Steve Smith and the guys that he works with, Clark Richens, and Tony McNeely and, and many others, Jeff Hawk, those guys all went in there, worked their hearts out, got those lions removed. I believe they removed nine or 11 the first year, and then it was, you know, there was less lions as years went on. But then the, the, the sheep recovery was probably one of the most documented and dramatic recoveries that we've ever had. And they've, there was a paper that was published about it that really did, did dodge the bullet. It never exclusively came out and said the main reason for this was the, the removal of those female lions. And it, I mean, I, I believe unquestionably in almost everybody's eyes at this point, that was what it was. And since then, Jim Bedlin has done the maintenance work in there and, and, and kept quite a few lions out of there. And, and as, as of today, I believe that all of that's going to end from what I heard recently, because the environmentalists have blocked the desert sheep horn and the game fish department's ability to relocate those, those sheep. I had always hoped that would be a place that we could go to and transplant some of the greatest genetics in the world, as also Aravifa would be, and then move them to other locations and, and continue to relocate those sheep. But since they've blocked the helicopter work in there, I don't even know if anybody's going to continue to do the lion work, which would be a, a, you know, a shame, obviously. I mean, you're an expert in that area, and you know how many great sheep have come out of there and how many are still potentially going to come out if we keep that lion population in check on that lake. Yeah, it'll be really a shame to see that population decline if the lion hunting stops. Um, Floyd, there's a big threat, uh, obviously, with California banning lion hunting, um, California banning uh, uh, bear hunting with dogs. Um, talk about the threat of, of lion hunting through politics. And, you know, with that question, what do people that don't understand they don't understand what will happen when we try and eliminate lion hunting i mean it's it's a lot like uh new york and washington dc politicians trying to tell people out west what to do and 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 tell me some of those first what are, what are the threats and and second what do they not understand uh from someone like you that's on the ground and understands it clearly well, and I don't know that it's limited to anti-hunters. You know, I see plenty of resentment towards people that hunt hounds amongst the general hunting public. Um, I, you know, one of the things you in the state of Arizona, the fact that we have it, it is illegal to snare or trap a lion or virtually any animal outside of uh, private property and on any public lands, you've removed any ability that you will ever have to control the lion population if we lose that. And while lion, lion numbers today are at an all-time low for what I've seen in my hunting career, there was a time 10 years ago where if people weren't harvesting 300, 350 lions a year in Arizona, they would have decimated our deer herd. Uh, you can do the numbers if a lion eats one deer a week or, or a similar prey animal, extrapolate that out to you know an additional three or 400 animals plus their reproductive ability. And, and you can just see where the prey species would have ended up shortly. And I think we would actually have some very steep uh, or very wide swings in the pendulum uh, as far as 
uh, prey populations from highs to lows without that ability to manage lions. And what what do you what do people they don't understand um, as far as the politics of lion hunting? I mean, it it comes down to the you know a lot of the uh, a housewife that just sees it as as barbaric and oh thinks it's uh you know the lion's not it's not fair and from from someone that hunts uh a lot and you know is not successful a lot you know is way more unsuccessful than successful even being a great lion hunter like you are what are some of the things that they just don't get with the whole thing well i mean it's it's always interesting. The photos you always see are of a lion in a tree or a lion dead with a bunch of hounds mauling it, whatever it may be. Yeah, most people don't realize that, you know, there were seven or ten days of brutally hard work that went into the result that they're looking at. And, you know, I don't know how you convey a message to somebody, Jay, that is incapable of physically going with you and doing even one day of that. And to they're the same people that support having wolves reintroduced in Arizona. They don't live among those wolves. They don't deal with those wolves. They don't worry about their their business being affected by them or their even their pets. They typically live in an apartment or a condo or some house where their neighbor can reach out the window and, and hand them something. And, and for those people to even understand what the outdoors is all about, it's almost inconceivable on the level that you or your listeners or people that we like to associate with do. And I really think the only way that you can work with those people is simply to beat them at the ballot box and to raise more money than they can raise and to fight them in 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 the ballot that or at the ballot box. That's that's the only thing I know we can do with them because I do not think you can convey that to them. Yeah. No, I think I think you're dead on with that. Um I, I heard you say that uh, lion population in Arizona is at an all-time low. I, I wanted to double back to that just real quick. Um, you're saying it's at an all-time low, but you're not saying in any way that lions are endangered or what some city selector would hear you say is, oh, they're in trouble, and, and you're not saying that at all, are you? No, no, I, uh, I probably should clarify that. Lion numbers right now, I'm having more trouble finding lions than I have in the last it, it, actually, the, it's the worst I remember, but they're a very, very reproductive animal. You know, those females can raise a litter of kittens every two years. They have, you know, they only have six kittens in a litter, and half of them get killed by predators or just attrition. But they are very prolific, and they they can bounce back extremely quick. And I have no concerns about the lion population right now. The house is not on fire, so I'm not out trying to <laughs> tell anybody that we need to stop lion hunting. But it's um, it's definitely interesting to me. One of the reasons that Steve Smith devoted the time and money he did to the Unit 22 study was to bring awareness about the ability of hounds and census work that could be done with trained houndsmen. I mean, that the Derringer clan, there are there's innumerable people that, that you and I both know that are capable of of doing work where they can tell you how many lions are in an area and our game and fish department and sportsmen in general tend to react right now. Everybody wants to kill every lion under the sun because they're eating all the, the deer, you know, and, and, and sheep. But the reality is right now they're at an all time low and nobody's taking that into account. Um, our, our lion harvest numbers dropped significantly from last year and they'll drop again this year. But it's it's typical of peaks and valleys that you see in wildlife. There's certainly no, like I said earlier, the house isn't on fire. But it does bring us back to what Steve was trying to do, which was census work. And that is where the department is more on top of it and reacts in a more, uh, a quicker fashion to both the declines and the surges in lion populations as they relate to prey base. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, one question I have is, um, you know, being a sheep and deer and elk hunter, uh, it's very easy to have the mentality that, you know, kill every last one of them. I, and and I, I may have said that at, from time to time, but deep down I don't mean that because I do believe that lions do have a place in nature. I just think it's important for us to make sure that we keep those predators under control so that 
the other animals can, you know, uh, survive. Um, one thing I know with lion hunters from what I've heard is that a lot of times uh, lion hunters will uh, let um, let the females go. Is that is that correct in that the idea is to, uh, in areas where you know, because you ride it all the time, Steve Smith, all the different lion hunters, you guys, what you're saying is you have a very good census and survey of what's there, and there may be areas where uh, you know that the lion numbers are low, so you may let some females go, or other people may let females go. Is that true? Well, the, the lion hunter that you know has mentored me and a friend, and, and I'm sure has killed more lions than any man ever alive, is Jim Dewar. And Jim Dewar turns lions loose once in a while. You know, he's, it's not. It, there are times, first of all, that from a legal standpoint, you must turn them loose. Uh, if, right. if somebody's there who doesn't want to put a tag on it, then you you legally have to turn that lion loose. And right. and, and then many lion hunters are they've become frustrated with the sheep society, and not the sheep society in particular, game and fish department, the sheep societies, what appears to be a push to annihilate lions statewide, and. You know, I, I know some of those guys right now are definitely, you know, a little bit of a pushback. And, and yeah, they're going to turn them loose. And once these lions are turned loose once or twice, they're extremely hard to catch. So, yeah, that goes on. <laughs> they, 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 they learn know, quickly, they, don't they? Yeah, people have always, you know, nobody has an idea about a cat's IQ, but it, it is the equivalent of that of a canine. So, you can imagine how, uh, if they were tough to catch the first time, it certainly doesn't get easier the second time. Um, Floyd, I know you as well as other lion hunters have had, you know, basically train wrecks, um, lion hunting, whether it be, you know, stock problems or, or, you know, being out in, in the pitch black dark and no GPS, whatever, can't figure way out. Um, is there any particular story that you could tell us that, of uh, any kind of train wrecks that you, you've had that, uh, you know, you you laugh about now, but weren't too fun at the time. You know, uh, kind of fun one. I don't know if you got the long enough show to to stand this. I'm trying to speed <laughs> it up. But Joe Mitchell and I have hunted together off and on for twenty twenty years. Anyway, we uh, one day dropped Joe off, and and uh, we were in the canals, and he was going to hike up a canyon and check it out. And he hiked up there. Long story short, called us on the radio and said he didn't find the lion sign. And when he was coming back down. He uh, he found a lion on his tracks and, you know, very quickly called us on the radio, got us to turn around and come back. And we came back to him, and Joe didn't have his pack or his hounds with him. So, you know, I was giving him quite a rough time about picking a stick up and having a little fun. <laughs> so, but, but uh, Joe, so I turned Joe's hounds loose first out of his truck, and they trailed him up, and he put him on the track. And I grabbed his pack in mine, turned my pack loose, and we took off, and, uh, Marty Land, Marty Land, and Mike Sabo from RCM Machine were with us, and Julie was with us. So they they stayed at the vehicles, or they actually went up the mountain with us till we started to go over the canals. And we went from the Dripping Springs side over the canals, ended up catching the lion, and literally came out in the town of Globe at about ten o'clock that night. And if Marty hadn't been able to take GPS coordinates. We might not. We probably got picked up at the Taco Bell and blow. And <laughs> so, so, yeah, lion hunting. I mean, if you ever look at how many miles that is and how many feet of elevation, and the north side of the canals, we were about three foot deep in snow. So every time you took a foot, you, a step, you know, your foot fell through the snow. Joe looked at me at one point and he said, and this is one of the toughest guys I know. He looked at me and said, "You give me ten thousand dollars, I wouldn't do this again." <laughs> <laughs> I know there's been times when I've come into the outdoorsman's and seen you and it looked like your face had been bush whipped and, you know, I'm thinking, good night. What did you run into? And it's just, oh, just a weekend of lion hunting. And <laughs> it's not easy. Um, I, I've been with you one time and, and I can attest it is not easy. And it's, um, would you say the challenge of lion hunting is the biggest draw for you from a standpoint of how hard it is to, to dry, dry ground uh, lion hunt? Well, it's a combination of the challenge and the uh, getting to work with the animals. You know, there's probably nothing more gratifying than to take a, a, a mule that's never hunted lions and 
and, you know, teach it to get up through a set of blocks or off a cliff and, you know, and just go through a, a day of what, what riding does or to watch one of those pups that you raised from, you know, from a 10 week old baby, you know, open its first track and, and move it and begin to become a, a lion hunter or to see them at the tree when they finally, you know, first see what their quarry, quarry is. It's, um, those are the things, those, those three things, the challenge and then working with the animals and, and being, it allows you to be outdoors more than any other form of hunting that I know. So those three things are what have always been driven me to do. And I know your dogs, um, you know, it's funny to see the different personalities. Some of your dogs are, you know, they'll come up and you can pet them and they, you know, crawl in your lap and they're lovers. And then some of them, you know, you don't, you just kind of want to keep your distance from them. Um, talk, tell me uh, some of the names of your dogs and um, just throw out some names and then tell me about some of the different personalities of your dogs. Well, you know, there's one group of four pups that are, they're not pups, they're seven-year-old dogs now, but Jim Bueller uh, gave me a dog many years ago named Freckles, and we bred that years later to his best dog named Macho, and we ended up with what we call the Macho Puppies. And those four dogs, uh, it was a litter of eight, and Charlie Leader, Jim Bueller, and, and Casey Shields ended up with the other four. But Julie and I kept those four, and, and those dogs were, their names are Suede, Argos, Boo and Tyra. And we named Tyra Tyra because she's black and beautiful. Uh, Boo has a, a blue eye and, a, and a, uh, a brown eye, so she's just kind of spooky looking. And uh, Suede, old Vince Watts, one day came over and was petting him and said, his coat feels like Suede. That's how that dog got its name. <laughs> so he <it's, laughs> travels the, uh, who knows how they're going to get their name. Yeah. And I know, Floyd, you've had some dogs over the years, like like a lot of lion hunters, that are as good at dogs as you could ever have. And, and I know losing those dogs uh, for one reason or another is is like uh, uh, a parent losing a child. I know you and Julie are as attached to your dogs as, as any parent is to their child. Um, what is it that that makes a lion hunter have such an attachment with their dogs? I mean, I've heard the quote of saying, you know, you mess with the lion hunter's dog, you're basically messing with every lion hunter in the country. What is it that causes that bond? Yeah, I don't know. You know, most lion hunters, they say, are pretty pretty weird people. So, I mean, that's probably where I would start <laughs> looking. But <laughs> it, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's just that it, it's actually, it's a bond. You know, when you spend, it's kind of like hunt partners. Whenever you spend that much time in the field with any one person, animal, you know, you get real close to them. And and I think that's that's probably it. The other thing too is you know when you are around hounds, good ones, and you watch them work, and they work day after day after day. You, you know I, I can't you can't imagine how many times I've told my partners in these different businesses if we could hire a crew like this, it'd all be over. And we've got some of the best guys working with us, both as partners and employees that I've ever ever been exposed to in business. But man, I'd like to breed a little hound into some of them, and you know, just that level of work ethic and, and never ever giving up. I mean, I, I've seen pictures and stuff that Julie's, you know, you guys have taken where literally the dogs will literally crawl trees, crawl up cliffs. They'll they they would literally bite their own paw off to get to a lion if they had to. Um, is it just something that's bred in their nature that never give up attitude? That's just, you know that's the breeding uh, you know the the dogs that I currently have that are the best ones that I I use came from Steve Smith and Jim Bueller and those guys have spent their entire lives breeding for that for that dog that that doesn't give up for that dog that has exceptional physical skills and, and intelligence but if they don't have that that work ethic and they don't have that drive to succeed and to catch their quarry, you know, they're really never going to amount to anything. And, and that's, that is so bred into these dogs that sometimes it's a problem. I mean, you know, when you, when you breed animals, you many times the, the positive characteristics are amplified. So are the negative characteristics, but even a positive where a dog has that much drive, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, 
Jim had a couple of the dogs kill themselves. They literally ran themselves to death on the track at the heat. And, they uh, just wouldn't quit, and they killed themselves. Yes. Yep. Yeah, they, it's, it's amazing the tenacity that they have and the heart that they have. And, you know, it's it's uh, interesting to draw the correlation of having business partners that have that same tenacity. But the, the truth is, um, you know, if, if we all had a little bit more of that, we'd all probably be that much more successful. Um Floyd, I know you've hunted, uh, you know, you're a heck of a lion hunter, but you also have hunted lots of other animals. You've, you've hunted all sorts of sheep. Uh, you've, you've shot tremendous rams. You've been up, you've shot stone sheep. You've shot all sorts of stuff, big deer, big elk, big antelope. Um, but I know you've also gone on several 13 bee hunts and, and not pulled the trigger I wanted to kind of end the episode, talk a little bit about trophy hunting. And first and foremost, I would say that I've, I've said on this podcast many times, I am a trophy hunter. And, and part of what makes me a trophy hunter is I love to hunt. And I feel like by being uh, more discriminant and, and trying to harvest an older, mature, you know, larger, whatever you want to call it, um, I get more hunting time in. I would like to ask you a little bit about your thoughts on trophy hunting and, and uh, you know, see what you have to say about it. Well, I, you know, I think you, you, well, the 13 bee hunts are good ones to bring up. I guess we can use those for an example. Uh, I've sometimes since I've been in my thirties, I, I, I would call myself a trophy hunter, although I've certainly got animals that are nowhere near the trophy that many of my friends do that are true trophies to me, but they came about almost always by being very, very selective in the animals that I wanted to shoot and trying to locate the largest, you know, animal that, that was available or that, that I could find. And I never, ever was embarrassed or ever felt short on a hunt or like I have less of a hunt because they didn't shoot something. And to me, trophy hunting is the least consumptive form of hunting available today. Uh, I'd much rather leave a young buck or a, a, a small, a smaller deer than I would be proud of, or not proud of, but that, that, that I want to harvest. Uh, I'd much rather leave it for someone else that would be excited to shoot that deer and, and or let that deer attain the, the, the level that I'm looking for. But again, let someone else shoot it again three years later. I think one of the things we get caught up in with hunting anymore is just you have to be, you know, your measure of success is, is, is based on what you shoot or kill. You know, most of us, for the mo and as much as I enjoy eating wild game meat, I, you know, it's not why I hunt. I, it's, there's plenty of reasons and things that I can do to get meat and protein sources of that quality. So it is for me. It's it's about the opportunity to spend time out there, and the more time I get to spend, the happier I am. The more I get to engage the species, the happier I am. So I think trophy hunting is is probably the the oh at some point people are going to reach that level to where just shooting something is just not what they want to do, or shooting something the last day to say they did. That that's kind of the guy that I look at and go, really, I that one just it kind of it uh, it turns me off probably about hunting more than anything on that that level. Yeah, you know, um, I had a podcast with uh, Steve Ranella, and he had a really good answer about trophy hunting. As you know, you spend a lot of time around him. He has a tremendous way with words, um, but I thought he had a real good uh, description of trophy hunting. It was not a short description; it was a fairly long one. Um, but it's interesting to talk to guys like yourself and, and get a perspective. And, and from what I hear you saying is it's, it's more about the adventure. It's more about the experience. And if you can't find something that is uh, mature enough, old enough, big enough, uh, you're perfectly fine saying I still had a great hunt um, and I look forward to the next one. But, you know, you're not just going to shoot something on the last day to be able to say this is what I shot. Right. You know, and, and just hanging around Steve makes you wish you were as eloquent as he is. And, <laughs> and, and Steve's kind of the other side of the coin from me. Steve is genuinely bummed if he doesn't harvest something that he can 
that he can eat and cook. And, and it's, you know, on the lion hunts that we've done with Steve, we've been unsuccessful. And, and I don't know that I've ever been in the field with any one individual that I have as much respect for as a spokesman, as a hunter, and just flat a class act in his, in his crew. Those guys, they ran through the Galeros and through the Blue Wilderness with us. The film guys, Dan and Mo, backwards better than I went forwards. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they're just an amazing group of guys. But Steve is, you know, and that's what, you know, I guess it comes down to it's nobody should tell anybody what and why to hunt. And, and Steve and I are great examples of opposite ends of the spectrum on that in the sense that, uh, I mean, he really enjoys, and it's like he wanted to shoot a lion as much to eat it as anything. Yeah, he's uh, he's definitely one of a kind, and um, I look forward to having him on again, as well as I look forward to having you on again as well. I appreciate you spending some time with us today, and uh, I look forward to seeing all of the great things that uh, your company's uh, Western Hunter, Elk Hunter Magazine, Western Hunter TV, The Outdoorsman's, and wilderness athlete uh, do here over the next coming year. I know you've got a great crew out there and everybody's working hard and um, I just appreciate you spending some time with us here and uh, getting to hear a little bit more about lion hunting. is definitely something that fascinates me and intrigues me and they're an incredible animal and, and uh, getting to talk to you, uh, someone that spent as much time with them. It's uh, just a, a great pleasure and I appreciate you being on today. Well, Jay, thanks for having me, and I look forward to our next lion hunt. Okay, buddy, sounds good. <laughs> well, you take you take care and um, tell Julie uh, hello, and until I see you next time, God bless you. Okay, buddy. Thanks, Jay. Talk to you later. All right, bye. Bye.